Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola. By Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, an Alaska Native Corporation promoting economic and social progress for people throughout the state. By the generous support of the Alaska Native Health Board. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by the Alaska Commercial Company, Alaska's leading retailer of food, family apparel, and general merchandise in remote Alaskan communities, with continuous service since 1867. We are one people under one sky, with separate languages and ways. We are the heartbeat of Alaska. We open our hearts to you and welcome you to Heartbeat Alaska. Hello and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green bringing you native news across the north. Thank you so much for joining me. Today we indeed have native news across the North and the nation. Job Corps has a new center in Palmer. February 16th is Elizabeth Paradovich Day. We have news from KYUK in Bethel. In Naknek, they had their wintertime festivities which including dipping into the ice cold water. All around the state, we have a native musicale in Kotzebue, plus a native musicale coming up here with the Fur Rendezvous festivities. All that plus much more. But first, here's Gary Fife with native news across the nation. This is native news across the nation. I'm Gary Fife. The planned reductions by both the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Health Service have been met with criticism by native groups and demands for consultation. The Clinton administration has been favoring a government-wide reduction in personnel and the two lead agencies for Native Americans would bear reductions in the hundreds. IHS officials have stated that they would try to keep the reductions limited to administrative personnel rather than health care people. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has reported that its plan for reduction would be to streamline area agencies. The president of the National Congress of American Indians and various tribal leaders have complained that neither agency has consulted natives about their concerns for the planned federal reductions. The nation of Canada has announced cuts in its high, high tax rate on cigarettes and it hopes to cut the rate of tobacco smuggling across its borders, especially at the Mohawk Reserve at Akwesasne. That reserve has long been a source of contraband cigarettes according to local Mohawks and government officials from both nations. But enforcing the laws against such activity will not, be, will not be such an easy undertaking. The people of Akwesasne have always maintained that theirs is a sovereign nation and no outside law enforcement agencies will be allowed on their lands without their permission. Recent reports say the Akwesasne Mohawks would resist with force if Canadian police moved onto their territory. The budget request for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 1995 has been set at $2.24 billion, and a greater percentage of that sum will be under tribal control. The total figure is just slightly below last year's request, and about one-third of that total will be dedicated to Native education. The Tribal Priorities Program, which allows tribes to use the funds according to their priorities, is slated for a major boost, totaling $447.4 million, about 30% of the BIA total budget. The increase is to be used for law enforcement, social services, agriculture, and other tribal priorities. Native leaders from Ecuador and the embattled Chiapas region of Mexico will be on tour in the United States in the next months. The Indigenous People's Solidarity Tour will, being Quechua, will bring Quechua people from the rainforest and Mayan leaders who are currently conducting an armed insurrection against the government of Mexico. In Ecuador, natives oppose drilling in their region of the Amazon rainforests. In the Mexican state of Chiapas, natives have taken up arms to fight exploitation of their lands and the poverty in which they live. While in the U.S., the native leaders will visit seven U.S. cities to tell their stories and seek support. And finally, Northwest Alaska natives will be the subjects of another radiation study, this time to determine the effects of the 1960s Project Chariot nuclear testing program at Point Hope. 
The Arctic Sounder reported that Alaska Senator Frank Murkowski raised the subject during confirmation hearings for the next undersecretary of the Department of Energy, Charles Curtis. The new study will assess the possible effects connected with the 49 pounds of radioactive material buried at Point Hope on Cape Thompson. Local natives were never told about the radio radioactive site, and many have declared that unu unusual rates of cancer have been caused by that nuclear deposit. No date was given for the start of the study. This is Native News Across the Nation. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Gary Fife. Thanks, Gary. I'll be back with news from Alaska right after these messages. Let's travel now to Bethel with news from KYUK Public Radio and Television Station. Rhonda McBride has the stories. Thank you, Jeannie. Jamai from the YK Delta. Six southwest Alaska villages have filed a lawsuit against a Bethel-based tribal housing authority and the federal government. Villagers say the Association of Village Council Presidents Housing Authority and the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development are at fault for the shoddy design and construction of more than 200 homes built about 10 years ago. The feds and the housing authority say that the villagers are at fault because they didn't properly maintain the homes. Some of those homes were built in Mountain Village, where there have been several deadly fires. The villagers blame the workmanship of the homes and say that the housing authority and the feds knew about the problems and didn't do anything about them. Jeff Kennedy talked with Jim Davis, the Alaska Legal Services attorney who filed the lawsuit in federal court. We were told that the, the problems that exist primarily from people just not maintaining their homes properly. Um, you obviously disagree with that assessment. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, Legal Services has represented home buyers with these types of homes for maybe 15 years in these types of lawsuits. And every lawsuit, the, whether or not it's the AVCP Housing Authority or another housing authority somewhere else in Alaska, they always say it's not their fault, it's the home buyer's fault. They always say it's the home buyer's failure to do maintenance. But it's just not true. The facts show it's just not true. If you look back to some correspondence between the Housing Authority and HUD, for example, a couple years after the homes were built, the Housing Authority admits to HUD these homes are no good. The Housing Authority admits there are defects in the homes. If they're admitting two years after the homes are built that there are defects in the homes, how can they say when these defects become terrible and the homes now are hardly habitable, how can they say it's because of the home buyer's failure to maintain the homes? The villagers want their homes repaired and their house payments refunded along with punitive damages. The villages filing suit are Mountain Village, Kotlik, Alukanuk, Tanunuk, Atmouthluk, and Kasigaluk. Before we go into our next story, we should first explain that the Association of Village Council Presidents Housing Authority and the Association of Village Council Presidents are two different organizations, and this story is about the second organization. AVCP's annual meeting has been set next month for Tuxuk Bay, and one of the most important things on the agenda will be to elect a new president. Incumbent Myron Nanning faces two challenges from AVCP President Gloria Simeon and George Peter of Akiachuk. It was Nanning who hired Simeon as vice president. Simeon says as she's elected, she will hire Mark Charlie as Tanunik to succeed her as vice president. Nanning fended off a close election a year and a half ago from Yupiat Nation leader Willie Kasaili of Akiachuk. 
Yukon Kuskokwim Delta subsistence hunters will be glad to hear that Cackling Canada geese will be open to limited subsistence hunting this spring. The Waterfowl Conservation Committee voted to liberalize restrictions because the cacklers have rebounded remarkably. In the last 10 years, the population has increased sixfold. White-fronted geese are also making improvements, but efforts have been less successful for two other species, brants and emperor geese. The concept of limited hunting is a little bit confusing because technically it's illegal to take waterfowl in the early spring because of the Migratory Bird Treaty with Canada. The treaty fails to take into consideration that spring is just about the only time that geese fly over the region, also a time when subsistent hunters are hungry for fresh meat after a long winter of dried fish. The Waterfowl Conservation Committee and other Alaska Native groups are working to change that treaty but a federal court decision allows the Fish and Wildlife Service to exercise flexibility in enforcing the treaty. The Conservation Committee is made up of village leaders who have been working to protect threatened species. The committee has been instrumental in improving public awareness about the program. Well, February is a busy month for the YK Delta Region Schools. The Kasigaluk Agula School is holding an elders conference next week in which students will join elders in making traditional crafts. About a dozen other schools have been invited and they will all be performing Eskimo dances. Also, the Tanunik Student Puppet Theater will be performing a play based on an original Yupik epic poem. And in the village of Akiak, parents will be gathering for the Yupiat School District's annual education conference. Several hundred parents are expected from three different villages. The fourth annual conference is set for February 25th. Huithluck will be fe featured on a cable TV news program for kids. The program will air sometime this spring on the Nickelodeon channel on a children's show called Nick News. The CBS network also carries the program, which is hosted by former network anchorwoman Linda Ellerby. The segment on Queethluck will look at how high seas fishing affects village life from a child's point of view. William Olick, an 11-year-old Queethluck student, will be featured in the story. Segments for the report were videotaped in Queethluck this week. Nick News is produced by Lucky Duck Productions, a company owned by Linda Ellerby. We talked with Lucky Duck producer Woody Thompson about how he will approach this story. It's all documentary format, which means that nobody, I, I'm not a reporter, nobody hears my voice. Uh, there's no narration by anybody. It's these people, it's the Yupik Eskimo telling, um, telling their story without any aid from anybody else. So it's a really a way for them to tell the rest of the world, the rest of the country, and for William to tell his story. I'm, a t I'm an 11 year old Eskimo. This is my life. This is how I live. And these are the concerns that I have. Thompson says that the story will be about six minutes in length. And again, the program is scheduled to air on Cablevision sometime this spring. That's on Nickelodeon's channel and also on the CBS network. I'm Rhonda McBride. Thank you for joining us from all of us here at KYUK, Koyana. Thank you, Rhonda. Let's travel now to Palmer, Alaska, where there's a new Job Corps Center opening. People no longer have to travel outside for training. It's been a, a dream of many Alaskans for a long time. Job Corps has been in existence for 30 years, but so many Alaskan students who have gone to training down south um, are homesick. A lot of times the training areas uh, aren't compatible with the real market for jobs in Alaska. The climate's different. It's a long way from home. So the, the survival rate in Job Corps centers down south has been relatively poor. Um, the curriculum plan for this Job Corps center was designed with Alaskan youth in mind and the Alaskan economy. According to Marianne Estelle, the program manager for Alaska's Job Corps, one of the most beneficial aspects of the new center is the academic programming allowing one to get their diploma if they didn't have it before. It's part of the program, academic studies for those who haven't finished high school, and then also there is assessment for reading, writing, and math so that if, even if a student has finished high school, if some of their specific skills are low, we want them to be competitive in the marketplace so that we will teach them in whatever areas they may. 
According to Estelle, many young people who are single parents cannot afford child care while training anywhere. The Alaska Job Corps Center has taken special care to address these needs, making it possible for single parents or young parents to get the training they need. The Alaska Job Corps Center is that it includes residences and facilities for single parents, male or female, with one or two children. They're, they will be able to live in the residence with their children and then attached to that is the Early Childhood Center, the Child Development Center, which is co-located with a Head Start program. So there will be child care while the students are in training as well as that will be used as a laboratory for the people who are studying early childhood development and Head Start teaching. Not only is a curriculum designed to suit Alaskans' needs, Job Corps also covers the cost of the training as well as paying transportation costs to and from the center. We pay for everything. It's, it's part of what we do. We make the travel arrangements. Uh, all the expenses from the time students leave home until they get back home at the other end of it. We signing up is starting right now, officially uh, Monday, February 14th. It's a very easy process. We have a toll-free number. Uh, we are happy to receive phone calls. We are happy to send materials out. Most job services offices have those. Many school counselors offices have them, JTPA and uh, the employment and training offices of the Native Corporations. Uh, can make those things available. It's wonderful. This training program is really um, excellent. The facility is wonderful. It's the best in the nation. Everything there was designed and planned for Alaska and for these particular needs. I also From Palmer, we travel to southwestern Alaska to Naknek for the Bristol Bay Winterfest four days of winter fun with some activities attracting only those willing to take the plunge. Five, four, three, two, one. What just happened was we have our uh, penguin dip every year. This is our 10th annual dip. We cut a hole in the ice, and everybody that signs up, uh, they jump in, and who could go in the fastest and come out the fastest, unassisted, uh, wins first place and then it goes all the way on down. Okay. 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 Uh, how many jumpers did you have today? We had 15, 16, 17. And we don't usually go that high. We like to do 10. But the weather was so good and it wasn't uh, 75 below chill factor like last year. Oh, so we got to get more. Uh huh. Yep. All right. And this is part of the Winterfest, correct? And this is part of the Winterfest 1994. And Pete's been uh, assisting me for three years now. He's one of the <laughs> handlers here also. For 10 years, the three communities of Naknek, King Salmon, and South Naknek have been getting together for the Bristol Bay Winterfest. Activities originally started to ward off cabin fever. The three days are packed with activities, but the most popular is the penguin dip. First time jumper. A first time jumper. Uh -huh. now, now, what kind of a brain injury did you suffer this year that you signed up for this? Yeah. Actually, it was a brain injury from last year. So <laughs> I told this woman that if they had everything feasible to get, make sure I got back out again, that, that I'd do it. Uh -huh. So she was going to wait up, find her on a dunker and all this kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And then the final analysis, I just jumped. So, so now, now that you've done it, what do you think? Well, I'd do it again. Well, I've done it, uh, this is the third year in a row, and uh, hey, I think it's, a, for one, it's invigorating as heck. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and it's, uh, it's a really a fun thing to do, and I'm, I was going for the championship this year, but I don't think I got it. You don't think so, huh? I don't think so, but uh -huh. that's all right, it's, it's a good time, and uh, a lot of people turn out. Uh -huh. It's a very safe event, and uh, people seem to like it. Like it or not, they compete. Competition is based on who gets in and out of the icy water the fastest. None of the contestants seem to want to hang around for a leisurely dip. Third place went to Leslie Nash Puck with a time of 4.25 seconds. Second place went to Alan Gilliland 
with 4.14 seconds and number one champion went to Sonny Regan. He made the plunge in and out in 3.97 seconds. In this Winterfest, there was more than one way to take the plunge. Well, some of the dogs are afraid of the ice, so they tend to stick with the snow, snow patches or tundra patches. Uh-huh. Yes. All right. And, and this race has been going on for how many years? I believe since 1989. Uh-huh. Now, how many villages are participating this year? We have um, Kayla, I mean, excuse me, Eliamna, Eliamna, Naknik, and Togia. Six teams were included in the dog race. We don't have the results, but we do know that everyone was included in on the banquet later that evening. All right, and those awards will be handed out tonight? Yes, they will. Okay, good. Yep. Now, uh, uh, who's invited to this banquet? Everybody. Uh, everybody's invited. In the whole wide world can come here. All right, great. Everybody's invited. All right, thanks, Judy. Even Jeannie Green. <laughs> well, Jeannie Green couldn't make it to the banquet, but that doesn't mean she couldn't enjoy the food. Well, sort of. Jeannie, we had a table reserved for you. You didn't come, so I guess we'll sit down and eat the agudak and, and the smoked fish and have a cup of tea. I thought that was very nice. The good people in Naknek had set a place for me, even though I couldn't make it to their winter festival. Or maybe that was punishment to show me what I missed. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm invited to a second one. This is a second annual winter festival, this time in New Lotto. And the dates are February 24th, 25th, and 26th. It's going to be a three-day event just packed with good time at the basket and music. And Will Mayo will be speaking, along with Maury Thompson and Glenn Olson and many others. So if you're in that area, give them a call. I'm sure they'll want you to attend. Let's travel now to Kotzebue. With the Fur Rondi coming up, the Native Music Hall here in Anchorage is one of the most popular events. Recently in Kotzebue, they had their own Native Music Hall. <laughs>
you so much, Lori Milton of Kotzebue, for that video. I truly enjoyed doing it, and I wish I could have put more groups on. I'll be doing that throughout the year. We'll be back with more news from Hartfield, Alaska, right after these messages. Plan to attend the 1994 Native Music Hall, February 15th through the 18th, at the West High School Auditorium, 7:30 each evening. Wasted years, wasted years, wasted years. Oh, how foolish! As you If you have news or information from your community that you would like to share with our viewers, please contact Heartbeat Alaska at 2611 Fairbanks Street, Suite D, Anchorage, Alaska, 99503, or give us a call at area code 907-272-8111, or fax us, 272-7005. Before we sign off today, I have a few messages. Recently, I met a woman named June Aiken. She's involved with an association called the Little Dribblers from Barrow. They're trying to raise some money to have a tournament with all the villages from the North Slope Borough. If you can help, contact Mr. Bob Herichick, who's the president of the Little Dribblers Association. And before we sign off, I have to say hello to Kion of the Hornets and Ruby of the Little Devils. Also to Lukey and Deluck in Barrow and Sherman. If you're going to be in town for the Fur Rendezvous Parade, I invite you to stop by our Heartbeat Alaska Studios. The address is 2611 Fairbanks Street, Suite D. We're right across the street from the Sears Mall. Also, if you happen to be coming to town for the Fur Rendezvous that particular weekend, Saturday, February 19th, and you'd like to join us, we're going to have a float in the parade, and we'd love to have you march behind, carrying a sign from your village. Give me a call at 272-8111. I realize this is short notice, but maybe we can pull it off. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jeannie Green. Join me again next week where we'll be featuring a story on Elizabeth Paradovich. She was a Clinkett woman who fought racism in her day and made big changes for all of us here in Alaska. Thank you so much for joining me. Please do send me video from your village. I'd also love to hear from our viewers across Canada, Greenland, and Russia. Please, if you're in Arizona, get me some video. We are really anxious to hear from everyone. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jean Green. Join me again next week for more Native news across the north.